Basically, we're doing some training today, uh, different type of rescue techniques. Uh, most of the time, people do, when they do rescue techniques, they do it on a nice 80 degree day, fair day, uh, nice calm day. We're trying to do something a little bit different, a little colder, colder conditions, ice out there, snow, it's just a little bit of everything going on. Because um, when we're out there, usually in the warm days, you have just your regular uniforms on. Say we have Mustang suits on and dry suits, MSC 900 suits. Uh, it makes the, the rescue a little more challenging. So when we have a situation like this, we're more prepared, we're trained for the situation, hopefully get that victim out of the water a lot sooner, a lot quicker, a lot safer. Well, the first thing I noticed is that no matter how much training you do, uh, when it's cold and windy and nasty like it was today, uh, everything's a little bit harder than it would be uh, normally. My experience today was actually pretty interesting. Uh, we do a lot of rescues on the water, but it gets complicated when you start getting throwing more cold and ice and snow in there. Um, the deck was very slick. Well, actually, we do train in any type of weather because uh, you never know when an emergency may happen. It's one thing to put this suit on when it's 70 degrees and you jump in a pool, you jump in the lake, the water's 65, you get a little water in you, it's fine. Doing it when it's 28 degrees outside and it's windy, it's blowing, the water's 36 degrees, it's a whole different animal. So really it's best to train and practice in all different types of weather and different types of scenarios. Today we practice a couple different techniques on how to get people who are in the water into a boat. Uh, it's not usually that easy. Um, you may find someone that has a life jacket on which really facilitates things. If not, you have to kind of improvise and find out what is best to use. Uh, the biggest thing I think is uh, consider what you have on board. Um, as far as using tools, your equipment, we had a backboard also. Um, we tried that earlier just as you know, a test trying to see if you can use the leverage on the backboard and just kind of slide them up like a slide. Um, by far, it's just knowing your equipment, what your abilities are, and every situation is going to be different. So, the more you train, the more you practice, the easier it's going to be. Basically, we had two different types of methods we used today. First, we had a sling underneath uh, the victim's arms. We get the leverage of the victim uh, so we're not bending down. We use more of our legs and our back and our body, uh, upper body, help pull the victim out. Put a, the sling underneath the victim's arms. You bounce the victim. We do three times on three, you pull them up because the freeboard of the boat is so high, you need the leverage to get the victim over. You don't want to jerk them up because you could hurt, hurt or damage the victim. So, the second uh, thing we do, we have a dive door in our vessel and you uh, remove move the dive door and you have a small freeboard right there. So what you do is you use a sling, a sling would help you a little bit, but you just grab the victim's life jacket, and bounce them up a couple times with two people that is, you pull them right on the vessel nice and gently. Um, obviously the smaller the person, the easier it's going to be. Um, the larger the person, the harder it's going to be. So if you have a dive door, it's a big benefit. It was definitely easier using a sling with a high freeboard because not only does it give you a purchase point on the person, um, it also gives you a handhold to pull them further on board and if for some reason you let go, it's easier, you know that they're still going to be floating, there is some flotation to it. We've used rescue slings in the past, um, that's not real new to us, however the packaging and getting them all packaged up in, in a nice cocoon, that's new to us. The process uh, entailed getting the victim and moving them very carefully and gingerly and getting them inside a, a visqueen cover and then taking a um, sleeping bag and securing them in that and while throughout the time frame taking time to make sure that he was not moved around excessively, reassured and packaged for transport. I think with Dr. Giesbrecht, uh, he really made me think of using just a simple visqueen and uh, you know something uh, just a cheap sleeping bag and using that to wrap the victim in there, keep them warm, and it was amazing how much that piece of plastic and that sleeping bag kept that victim warm. Once that victim was in there for even 15, 20 minutes, once we opened him up so that he could go get rewarmed, it was amazing how much heat was generated just by his own body inside. You could actually feel it. Some of the things that I didn't realize that were very crucial are things as the vapor barrier, how important it is. And you take for granted sometimes these small distances and the uh, temperature of water that how significantly affects a victim, that it does make a significant comfort level and it affects them greatly if you do stabilize them, if you do wrap them in a barrier, and if you are more gentle with them during transport, they really said that it was remarkable on how much more comfortable and how it really did affect their body. The biggest the biggest things we've learned is just, just 
being real gentle with a patient, is not moving them around a whole lot, is, is taking your time. Rescues are usually a hasty situation, but the understanding that for the benefit of the patient, we need to slow down and make sure we're very deliberate in our moves and how we package the patient. If I had to pass something on to other responders, definitely practice, wear your life jacket, make sure you're dressed for the weather. It makes a big difference. If you don't have to wear, worry about yourself, you can concentrate on what you're doing. The main thing I would like to pass along is uh, the importance of training. Uh, you have to train on a regular basis. Uh, you have to use it or you lose it. I think it's best for anybody watching this DVD to really know your equipment, know the surrounding community's equipment, uh, train together. Don't just train with your fellow firefighters. Get to know your neighbors next door because they may have a better way of doing something and so you need to share your knowledge and vice versa. The biggest recommendation I have is knowledge and skills tied in together with training. you got to have the knowledge, and today we've been provided an extensive amount of knowledge on the treatment of a hypothermic patient. Um, in addition, also, that you got to train on this stuff. You have to do the hands-on practical application of it. Uh, the video is going to be very helpful from the benefit that you're going to get to see how some of these techniques, how they can be performed. But then the key is the next step is, is to take it and practice those skills.